So good afternoon, everybody, ladies and gentlemen. It's good to be here. Today, I would like to share a story with you. Uh, it's a story of how we uh, wanted to increase scalability of our product, and we did it in a completely wrong way. And then we did it in the completely right way, and I will show you both. And uh, it's probably obvious that JBoss is part of the right way, not the wrong way, of course. So just to give you information about myself, my name is Andrzej Krajček. I'm very familiar with this room because uh, this is my alma mater, so for me this is a happy time that I can be here again. Um, I work for a company called Vysoft. It's not that far from the building of Red Hat here in Brno, and we are using uh, JBoss technologies in our products, so that's why I'm here today. Thank you, Radek, for inviting us, by the way. <laughs> Um, there's one more person I would like to introduce, and that's my colleague Honza. He's here with us today. Now he's a little bit surprised because I didn't show him this slide. And uh, he is the, let's say, InfiniSpan magician in Ysoft, the main one. So if you have really tricky questions, don't ask myself, ask him. He's the one hiding below the table now. And just to give you a clue what's Ysoft, I will be short. I'm not going to give you any commercial bullshit today. Um, Ysoft is a Czech company, not big one, small one. We are a global company operating all over the world. Ysoft is an original startup of four students originated here on Masaryk University. And we are working with software and hardware. That's all you need to know today. Um, so, as I told you, um, we started with the project I'm going to talk about five, six years ago, where we wanted, based on customer demand, we wanted to increase scalability for our products. I mean, uh, going from some throughput limits, increase them, push the boundaries further. Mm. Yet, at the same time, we wanted to retain the properties of the centrally managed solution, so that you don't have to deploy and have uh, an army, army of administrators going from location to location, administer anything. So that's what we call kind of cloud these days, but that's a buzzword. So I'm not going to use it today either. Um, so that's what we wanted to do. What's SafeQ? What, what's the product I'm, I'm talking about today? It's actually uh, very simple. It's uh, a kind of intelligence pooler, you can say, what we are doing is that, except of spooling the print jobs, we are doing some pre-processing of print jobs, conversions from color to grayscale, some transformations. We are doing authentication, authorization of users. Not everybody can print in any organization. We are doing auditing, cost allocation, reporting, so that the customers know how much do they print. We are doing failover convenience for the users. If the printer is broken, you will go to another one. You can print anywhere so that you don't have to bother. It's location transparency. Um, the administration configuration of the, of, of the product is web-based. What you can see here is a thing called terminal. It's used for printers. Uh, I will use the acronym MFP or MFD throughout the presentation. That stands for multifunction printer. It's that big thing which can print, scan, copy, a bunch of other stuff. And this is also our product, hardware and software as well. That's what's used for authentication, for reading the cards, giving some feedback to the user's user interface. The original architecture of the system was very simple. It was, uh, for, for the biggest customers, what we used was a kind of cluster. It's uh, based on our own technologies, uh, based on database replication, so it's fairly straightforward. We are using PostgreSQL as a database backend, and we have some synchronization tools which are replicating the data uh, based on some data lifecycle uh, among the databases. It's a low latency solution, so you can see the data uh, on all the cluster nodes, mostly in real time, and for, for, the, for printing it's sufficient, so it's okay. There are no crazy, uh, crazy latency requirements, I mean, in terms of milliseconds or something like that. Uh, the cluster is transparent to the users, so we have implemented support for 
um, load balancing for uh, transparent redirection of print jobs between these servers. This is implemented in uh, some client tools which we are deploying to the workstations, Linux, Mac OS, Windows, of course, and to the terminals which are attached to the printers. So that's one, of, one more reason why we need these boxes. But we need these boxes there. So that, that was the start. And we wanted to take this and extend the scalability, uh, the scalability limits, or the throughput limits. So uh, what, uh, oh yeah, just sorry, I just wanted to uh, share with you uh, the basic architecture and the basic features for what, what the solution does. So we wanted to take this, you know, straightforward process, uh, going print jobs, traveling from the user PC to some kind of uh, spooler, intelligence spooler, and at some time, at some point in time, it's released and delivered to the printer so that it's printed. And we wanted to take this and, and uh, push the scalability limits. Um, just to give you uh, the clue uh, about the context which you are talking about, it, the system is usually not standalone, so it's not that simple. Um, it's integrated with identity management, it's integrated with some crazy third party legacy, completely unknown applications like SAP. Uh, uh, there are some, some tools for reporting, there are mainframes which are also printing AS400. Um, other, other applications, you, some customers have some special proprietary databases for storing, accounting, auditing data, so that's what we integrate with. So the scalability is not only about you know, taking an, a self-contained solution and pushing it further, but also maintaining these integration bridges as well. So what we put as an idea, which we wanted to realize, is that we decoupled the application logic, which was originally here, and we decoupled the application logic to two uh, layers, this one and this one. This one is called RS or ORS. RS was the original architecture, the, the wrong one. RS stands for remote spooler. The new one was called ORS, offline remote spooler. Um, CML, uh, those who are Czech speaking probably know what the acronym stands for. Uh, in English, it's central management layer. Uh, so this, this part is used for managing the solution configuration. Here we maintain these ident identity management integration bridges and, and integration with other systems. Here is the place where the processing of print job occurs. So it's, uh, the decoupling is about uh, having the jobs processed only locally. Here we are transferring only kind of metadata for, for storing them in, and then creating the reports and, and so on. So um, there were some really major flaws uh, built into the system. The first one I would like to mention is that uh, the remoting which we implemented in the system was uh, rather primitive. The problem was that we decoupled the application logic into two, uh, into these two layers, and we used facades which were, uh, uh, let's say, implemented on the wrong, on the wrong place in, in the product design. So the, the synchronous dependencies which were in the product were spanning these remounting boundaries, and uh, the application logic just expected that the synchronous system which was there originally would behave the same, uh, even though there was a distributed layer encapsulated uh, below, and uh, that didn't happen, of course. So, so latency was one of our biggest enemies, and uh, uh, that that was the main limitation factors of scalability of the solution. Um, that was uh, this synchronous implementation and then this uh, synchronicity, which was built into the application logic, was the major problem. We also have implemented a proprietary message messaging. Uh, why we did uh, such a thing? Uh, that, that is because it was the year 2007. And uh, that time, uh, nice, decent uh, message queuing things were not available yet. Today, the, the situation is completely different. So at that time, to have the control over uh, latency of the solution, to really be able to fine tune it, we decided to go uh, the most uh, difficult way and to build our own. Well, we are still using it, by the way, but we plan to replace it with something, something else. 
so so the synchronicity was part of the problem and uh, uh, we realized after doing some uh, pre-production deployments that so that's the wrong way to go. We managed to deploy the system uh, approximately to 50% uh, of what we needed. And uh, uh, after the deployments to production, we realized that there are other, other built-in problems as well. Uh, there was, uh, because of the synchronicity, even the central layer was a single point of failure. And uh, the durability of the solution was quite poor because uh, essentially, uh, and in case of failure of even the, the, the RS layer, we lost uh, most of the data, uh, not on in, the, in the entire system, but the statuses and uh, statuses of the print jobs and the accounting and so on. This seems like a, like a small thing, but the customers are highly sensitive about these, these things, so uh, that was really a big problem. So, as we check, say, Spadkin Astromi, and we did the tough decision, we made it uh, to do a complete system redesign. So uh, we started from the scratch, we just throw everything away and, and starting uh, going the right way. So first of all, we have defined three, uh, three key requirements which we placed on the solution. The first one uh, was that uh, the RS layer, which we called ORS at this time, uh, shall be able to operate autonomously. I mean, even if you lose the connection between the RS and CML, you, the, this location, the RS server still has to be able to, to work, to, to serve users and uh, do not impact their user experience in any way. So that, that was the first requirement. The other one was persistence. So even in case you uh, do something with the local servers, uh, restart the ORS services, shut them down, and then uh, run them again after two weeks. Y you need to retain all the data. That's <coughs> quite quite natural requirement, I think. And of course, that the system shall be designed uh, uh, asynchronously, so there will be no synchronous dependencies, especially across the remoting the, the remoting boundaries. So that so that the application logic, which was in CML, should not depend on any uh, data to be timely uh, retrieved from the ORS and vice versa. No synchronous dependencies. That was really interesting fight in our company to accomplish this. So uh, we have divided the system into several components. The most important one is the data cache. Uh, we wanted the data cache to be persistent, to be searchable, to be, uh, let's say, zero maintenance so that uh, uh, it shouldn't require any special, uh, regular uh, vacuuming and, or, or things like that. It should be really self-reliant, encapsulated as much as possible from a set it and forget it type of thing. Um, we have... Uh, extended our messaging, uh, message queuing solution. We have added uh, some uh, um, components to aid replication. I'll mention that in detail later. And also to, to support uh, asynchronous service invocation. We have completely uh, thrown away um, our load balancing implementation and we created a new one, uh, which is based on, uh, let's say, selective service denial that that's actually quite easy. Each message which uh, is uh, transferred between the two components contains a cost estimation in some imaginary units. And this uh, cost is then evaluated by the component which is receiving the message, uh, the message queen component, and it decides whether it's able, considering the current load of the server, to process this particular message and in case it's not possible, it just throws the message away and it sends the response to the, to the sender that the sender shall either contact another server in the system or uh, delay the message processing. So that's what we call selective service denial. And deployment, ah, we also enhance deployment of the solution. We wanted to have 
completely unattended. Uh, not only deployment itself, but also, initial, but also initialization and configuration of the, of the system, which we are also managing centrally. So, um, it's, I think, obvious that the data cache which we are using is uh, JBoss cache or was JBoss cache. And uh, I want to say a few words about how we are uh, using it. Uh, first of all, we have, we have decided to use JDBM JDB backend, which is part of the, of the cache. Uh, for persistence, we have implemented our own cache loading layer. I don't know how uh, much you're familiar with uh, JBoss cache and uh, its architecture, but cache loaders are um, it's, it's a kind of integration point where you can implement your own uh, uh, data retrieval uh, so that it's transparent for the, for, the cache, uh, for the cache clients or for the cache actors. And uh, this, is, uh, this is what we have used to enhance the, the loading of the data. Uh, we have uh, used the Hibernate search, which is, which is part of JBoss cache for searching. And uh, the good thing is that uh, it was the integration into our application logic was actually quite easy because what we did is that we have re-implemented data access objects with uh, loose inquiries and then that was just it, that was most of the work. Um, what we had to do, and uh, that was also, a, a com let's say, a very important experience for us, is that we didn't have any lifecycle models for the entities which we were working with. We were a little bit ignorant to this stuff. Uh, Lifecycle model, I mean that we didn't have any formal description uh, for each entity, when uh, is the time and the component, where is the co com component where the entity is being created, how it's being, update, how it's being updated, and when it is destroyed or deleted. And uh, to really properly implement this, we had to enhance our uh, models with this information as well. Uh, that's also allowed us to fix a few bugs. That's what we had to do. Um, and we have also implemented a few caching strategies uh, using the eviction and extinction uh, capabilities of JBoss cache. That's uh, actually uh, also very important and that was one of the things which helped us to decide for JBoss cache is because some of the customers have uh, completely different uh, requirements as to what data, or, or no, 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 what data, but how to maintain a, a different data types. So for example, if you have authentication information credentials cached in the system, some customers have strict requirements that these data shall only be stored in memory, not, on, uh, not in any persistent storage. So uh, we are able, uh, thanks to this, we are able to handle these requirements only by configuration and we didn't have to provide any custom modifications. And the data in the cache is updated by replication. Uh, we are, our replication, or our uh, implementation of the caches is based on update protocols. So uh, we are, when we are sending messages to change the contents of the cache, we are already providing a fresh copy of the data. Uh, the other option is to use invalidate protocols, which only provide information that the data shall be invalidated. For the replication of the data, we have implemented uh, persistent replication buffers. And we did that also using the cache as a storage backend. So we, are use we have actually several caches in place in the system. And one of them is used to store the data which uh, are, which are are or shall be replicated from one uh, part of the system to another. <laughs> Communication patterns. Uh, the biggest fight which we had when we were designing the system was how exactly implement this. And uh, you know, it's uh, so, Tempting to uh, forget about the principle of asynchronous communication and just implement things, uh, uh, you know, 
in a way that yes you are using blocking calls but that doesn't non blocking calls sorry but that doesn't mean that the system is asynchronous just to give you an example uh, in uh, most of uh, the materials you can find that uh, the rest communication which is now being used to implement uh, interactive web application that it's asynchronous well I, I tend to disagree because it, it does not depend on the way how the communication between client and server is implemented but it is really about how the application logic is implemented and uh, you really have to take care of the way how you expect the data to be delivered and when because if you are just uh, Microsoft programmers usually uh, make this mistake uh, when you, if you are just using you know a synchronous API but you are still waiting for data you haven't improved anything so uh, one of the biggest one of the most important points in uh, our design was that we changed a lot of things and removed these dependencies even on the application logic level so the project wasn't only about you know just uh, putting there a cache and uh, retrieving the data from the cache and deal, deal done it was also about redesigning the application logic so that there are no inherent dependencies uh, on the data itself um, the basic communication model which we are using in the system is producer consumer it's a uh, indirect or i would say the most basic indirect messaging mechanism that the messages are de delivered to named consumers and the named consumers are you know uh, advertising their existence uh, the messages are waiting in queues it's it's really very basic it's nothing nothing special um we are using uh jboss marshalling and the river uh, uh, serialization protocol so that we uh, stopped using the original XML XML based messages which were based on the stacks parsing uh, and change it for for this much more efficient way how to present and, and transfer data um, we have also implemented a little bit more sophisticated uh, communication pattern and that's publish subscribe uh, it's also a well-known thing uh, we have a topic based publish subscribe model it is implemented as an extension of the messaging system so we are uh, maintaining a really strict design where the messaging system is rather basic and it only can transfer messages to consumers and all the other stuff we are uh, adding as uh, additional layers to the system um, and this way we have also implemented synchronous service invocation which is built also on the SM messaging so we are emulating the synchronous communication and we are only using it for critical parts like for example if you want to have if you want to invalidate the password of a user at the same time in the entire system you have some you have to have some way how to do it really quickly because that's a security concern so that's what we did and we have implemented or added to the system a message uh, level load balancing which means that if you have stateless consumers which are processing the messages uh, we are able to uh, balance the load on the level of, of individu individual messages to further optimize the, the distribution of load in the system what are the scalability implications of using JBoss cache in the system? So I showed you that we started with um, uh, a simple cluster at the beginning and now we have a system which is more scalable. And we have two scalability requirements. The first one is that you have rather small environment here but you still want to have the remoting because even small companies can have remote branches. So that's one of the typical requirements on the system. However, you can also have a little bit bigger deployment where you have several of these remote locations and also printers on the central location. And their throughput is also an important requirement. Just to give you an example of one of the, not the biggest, but bigger deployments of the solution 
th this is about the customer where we are we are using the original solution and then we have upgraded to the new ORS based solution and the final deployment has 600 sorry come back come back and now the deployment has 652 servers uh, in the system we are still using the application cluster on the headquarter location there are more than 2000 printers and the throughput is that we generate uh, approximately two terabytes of data per month which equals to more than three million print jobs in the system and this is based on JBoss stack uh, comparing these to the original numbers we were able to increase or to push the scalability limits of the system ten times so the original deployment uh, which we uh, were able to have was about like 200 printers per one installation here we have 2000 and we even can make more so uh, this is really just one of the examples not the biggest one some of them are unfortunately top secret so there are also important bandwidth and cost considerations which are also important uh, from the practical point of view uh, first of all let's look at this you have this is another customer story and uh, if you are using a normal uh, spooler based system like we did with the cluster that initially you have to have the print jobs traveling throughout your whole infrastructure this customer which we have here generates uh, 24 or 25 terabytes of data annually what, what I did just to uh, give you an example is that I took the price list of Amazon EC2 and S3 storage and calculated the cost uh, of the data transfers uh, using their price list if you deploy the decoupled solution the ORS based solution the print jobs are processed locally and only the metadata travels throughout the whole infrastructure so the reduction in terms of the amount of data this is based on real measurements is more than 95 percent you know uh, some of these big customers they are operating on outsourced infrastructure they are paying for it they don't own it it's not like university you know connected to Cessnet free network a lot of movies you know push back. <laughs> so so this is also important consideration and uh, this is also one of the positive results which we achieve by using uh, 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 or implementing the technology based, based also on JBoss. so and this is not the end actually uh, then we received uh, additional customer requirement and it's called print job probing to me it's completely crazy idea uh, you know why would somebody want to print a document or send a document for printing then travel 1000 kilometers and pick it up you know it's much easier just to go to the printer and print it so to, I, I still don't understand it to tell the truth anyway customers want it customers Rome and customers the boss so we uh, received this requirement to implement print job roaming and rather large scale because one of the customers uh, which we have has almost 4,000 devices in a location or let's say in an area which spans like 100 kilometers in the diameter and they have thousands of users commuting through this area and they want to have a full location transparency on print jobs in this completely crazy so there are insane latency requirements you know, because they are traveling by cars they are also sharing the print jobs so uh, we wanted to design the system with teleportation in mind so that means you print a document then you teleport to another location you appear there, there and you are able to pick your print jobs at, at a printer of your choice 
and we call it jopromine. So just to optimize it a little bit, we have uh, created a, a terminology of near and far locations. Near locations means that you have these densely populated areas where users are commuting frequently. Far locations are not interesting today for us because those are the locations where we have just few users traveling thousands of kilometers. So that's really not so interesting. But we have that uh, we had to come up with a solution for this near location that was the pain. Just to give you a more schematic uh, explanation of what we had to do, uh, this is a part of our model where we have one group of servers and we need to be able to migrate the data among these servers in minutes and the metadata in seconds. And then you can have second group of servers and with the same requirements, and moreover, we have to migrate the data among the groups as well. So this was the initial use case for this. And the answer was Infinispan. The good thing was that Red Hat managed to develop the technology soon enough. <laughs> Thank you. So, what we did is that we uh, replaced JBoss Cache with Infinispan, a new version of, uh, of JBoss Cache, and we used it, the capabilities of distributed caches in the Infinispan to implement this near roaming technology. So, we have divided the caches which we had in the solution into two groups. The first one contains only local data, the second one is distributed. Um, we are doing this to optimize the replication overhead. So we are not sharing all the data which are in the caches among the groups. What we are doing is that we are replicating only part of the data. For discovery, we are using TCP ping. It's, uh, uh, the transport layer is based on J groups. Uh, we are using TCP multicast, unfortunately. Uh, uh, unfortunately, because uh, most of the customers still do not support IP multicast. Unbelievable, it's 2013, but unfortunately true. And uh, based on our tests with TCP, let's say emulated multicast, uh, we are able to have up to 20 servers in uh, InfiniSpan clusters. That's not a very, very big number. We also support a UDP multicast, customers don't, where we can have hundreds of nodes. And we, so uh, part of the job which we now have is that we are pushing the customers to implement IP multicast. They will eventually do that with implementation of IPv6. Some of the customers still have to discover there is such a thing like as IPv6. We also implemented a kind of emulated searching on top of these uh, InfiniSpan caches. Um, that's uh, based on the notion of uh, data buckets. I'm not going to go into the details, but that would take hours. But what we are doing is that we are having a, a replication of the partial metadata, which are aiding the, uh, to build a kind of distributed, or let's say global spanning uh, search state space in which you can search for uh, brain jobs, users, and so on. And then when you find the data you need, you just use the reference in the buckets to retrieve the data from the originating service. The data backend is still JDBM. Uh, still JDBM, so InfiniSpan clusters. So we now have another deployment scenario, which just to give you an example, not only locations with single ORS servers, but also with ORS clusters, which are in the location the clustering is based on, on InfiniSpan. So, that was the first part. InfiniSpan, JBoss Cache, but we are also using Drools. So I would like to share with you also our experience with using Drools in our products. Um, we wanted to have a flexible way how to implement print job pre-processing conversions between 
color and grayscale, giving priority to users, adding watermarks, and so on. Also to implement failover for the users to increase the convenience of printing. Like printer's broken, redirect the print job. There is a very long queue of users already standing in the printer, redirect the job. Um, monitor printer st status, the printer's broken, shout. So that's it. And we wanted to have it really in a flexible way so that we don't want to hard code these rules or this decision making logic into the system. We rather want the ability to uh, have the user configure it. So we, we were looking for a rule based engine, for decision making engine, which uh, we can use to, to implement this. And we chose rules. So just to give you the idea, when the rules are executed in the system, Rules apply when the user uh, is printing the job, I mean sending the job from his computer portable device to the spooler. Then uh, the rules apply when the job is received, when the job is being delivered to the printer and when the user tries to authenticate at the printer as well. And we are using a simple trigger condition action model for the rules. Trigger is the place where or when the rules are executed, condition, action, that's obvious, if then else. But it's not only about rules. The rules is a very good, uh, let's say, rule-based engine, but we also needed a user interface. So what we did is that we have created a very simple user interface for creating these rules, for editing them. We have incorporated this into our web-based management, and what we implemented was a kind of conversion mechanism which stores uh, uh, the, the rules, sorry, which, which stores the rules in, a, in a, a, let's say, source code format and, and which parses the rules whenever the user wants to load and edit the rules and create this, uh, let's say, source code representation whenever the uh, user saves the rules. This is the, uh, uh, let's say, sample of the user interface. It's, it's very simple. The user is creating conditions uh, and, and sets notifications and actions for processing of the jobs. And I also wanted to share with you the example of uh, the user interface where the rules are listed and their internal representation. So this is what is happening in the system. Every time you do something fancy in the GUI, like dragging and dropping the rules, or changing the order, or uh, changing the name, changing the condition, we generate this representation, which is later compiled into the rule set and executed at the trigger points in the system. So this is one example of how the system can be used. And the rules are behind this because, uh, as you can see, what we are doing is that we are executing the rule sets, for example, in this case, at the time when the job shall be delivered to the printer. Uh, the system evaluates that based on the conditions, the document has to be converted into the grayscale from, from its color representation. And furthermore, we are adding this watermark, which is also configurable. It's, it's a very straightforward process. So, rules. Conclusions. 45 minutes is a very short time to give you UML models, source code snippets, and talk about all the uh, fun we had with the technologies. Um, but I hope that I uh, managed to share with you the message that uh, we really took JBoss Cache and related technologies and we implemented them in a commercially successful product. We are using it, customers are using it every day. Uh, even customers which I don't know, know about because uh, uh, we have uh, already thousands of deployments and we were successful with it. So this is also my way how to thank you for developing and supporting the technology because it's really cool. Thank you very much for that.
Questions? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that, that's a good question. Um, that's on one, of, on one of the previous slides. It's, uh, it's, uh, if, you, if, you, if multicast is not available, the cluster has up to 20 nodes. Because then uh, the overhead of the communication between the nodes in the distributed cache is too big, and it's, uh, the replication is too slow. And also, uh, the stability of the group, we, have di we did some experiments, and it's not, not, not that stable. So 20 is an absolute um, limit. With UDP multicast, it can be hundreds. It's, you, you, uh, um, I think that the good thing is that uh, you can configure, for example, the, the fill factor of the caches. So uh, it's not that every piece of data has to be everywhere. InfiniSpan works in a way that uh, every piece of data has to be somewhere, and you can configure the, uh, let's say, extent uh, to which the data are replicated. 100% means that every single uh, piece of data is everywhere. 50% means that uh, uh, the uh, appropriate half of the system is used for replication. So that's also aids in the scalability. Okay, can you tell me how many replicas have you used for single data? Um, we are usually uh, having uh, three replicas of every of uh, every single piece of data, but. Uh, for some for some uh, deployments, we are changing this. It's uh, for the big customers. It's always about fine tuning. Welcome. In in the caches. Yes, in the infinite uh, That would be too big. Um, <laughs> that would be too big data. No, we are using. We are only storing the metadata, not the print jobs. The, the print jobs are actually retrieve on demand, so whenever uh, you, you have the need to migrate the, or the roam the job from one server to another, you retrieve the metadata from the cache, and then we have some, I don't dare to call it content delivery network, some very simple <laughs> mechanism how to you know, retrieve the data on demand. Yes, that's what we did because we don't want to. Uh, that would be the print jobs are actually quite big documents because even th though you print something as simple, the print uh, uh, definition languages which are used nowadays are not very effective. You know, PCL, PostScript, uh, even simple documents can have tens or hundreds of megabytes. So it really has to be retrieved on demand, not to waste the uh, disk storage. There is one uh, more option in this uh, near roaming group. You can have a shared. Uh, you can have a shared file server, like a sh high speed shared storage, you know, storage area network there. And in that case, we would be able to retrieve the jobs from, from some third location, but that's not used in practice. We are considering it. What I can show you. It's, uh, it's ranging from kilobytes to megabytes. It really differs customer by customer, but I'm trying to find this, this slide. Here you can see the ratio, essentially. This. Exactly. Exactly. And this is the amount of data essentially stored in the infinite span. Because these are the metadata. So here you can see the ratio comparing the print job size to the metadata size. Basically out of time. Uh, if you have more questions, I guess you can talk. Uh, yeah, I can talk, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>